Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. The meeting will be starting shortly. While we wait, let's learn more about Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at exeternh.tv, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well.
to the Energy Committee meeting. My name is Renee Allen. I am chair of the Exeter Energy Committee. Tonight, we are going to be talking about, if you take a look at the visual agenda, we're gonna be talking about community power. We're gonna introduce it to you tonight. Then we're also gonna talk about our usual clean energy projects, education projects, and efficiency projects. But the star of the evening is community power. What it is, do we want it, how can you learn about it? We're gonna have a special presentation on that. But first, let's get down to some business and we can all introduce who we are. You wanna start down that end, Amy? Amy Farnham. Julie Gilman, select board rep. Uh, Lou Hitzrow. Um, Camille Weber. Betsy Stevens. Cliff Sennett. Excellent. Uh, first up, uh, business is to approve two sets of minutes, one from our last meeting and one from the special meeting that wasn't really a meeting where we had a tour of ISO New England. Any comments? I didn't see the minutes on the ISO, but I approve our last meeting. Yeah, okay. I make them the ISO either. But okay. Anybody else? Did anybody see the ISO minutes? Because they came I a little do. bit later. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we, um, they came a little bit later. So why don't we, we can hold off on those minutes or I can pass them around and you can look at them because they basically say no business was conducted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can I make a move to approve the minutes from last meeting? Sure. Can you just pass those around quickly? Um, yeah. So Amy says she wants to approve the, the minutes from the Wednesday, October 13th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and we'll give those other other minutes a couple minutes to pass around. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we're going to do before we start our presentation of community power is we're going to hear from Amy Farnham about a project she's been working on because she has to leave early. So we're going to change the agenda around a little bit, and Amy's going to talk to us about the a project we've been working on for a couple of years that's been delayed by COVID, but is back on the front burner, and this is the insulation in the town hall attic. Um, so, yeah. everybody have a look at those minutes? Yes. Okay. All right. Motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right, thank you. There you go, Amy. So uh, we've had both Yankee Thermal Imaging out of Rochester and Newell and Crathern out of Loudoun come through twice. Um, actually, Yankee Thermal only came through once, but they both put in quotes for what they would do um, up in the attic of the town hall. So I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever been up there, but it's quite a... It's quite a space. It's got multi-levels, sort of mm. not quite stories apart, but just different levels, lots of pipes, uh, lots of fire suppression things, um, and very old insulation in there. So the two companies, when they came in and looked at it, really the only difference between them was that Newell and Crathern wanted to remove all the old insulation first and then seal everything. You know, all the windows and the sill and all of that. Um, there's these old wooden air ducts that come up from both sides. Both companies were completely flabbergasted. <laughs> 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 They'd never seen anything it's an like old it. old-fashioned way of air conditioning. Yeah. Right. It's like but I mean, and these, you know, I, I think these folks have been in a lot of old buildings. This is what they do. Um, but they, they'd not seen anything the like that. Same thing at the IOCA. Is it really? Yeah. The same architect, same oh, HVAC, no. same, <laughs> <laughs> same method. Um, so right, so both of them, um, the scope of work for both companies is fairly similar, aside from that piece. So because Newell and Crathern would like to remove all the old insulation first, um, their quote is higher. So they're actually coming in at twenty two thousand, where Yankee Thermal's coming in at. 15.6 and we did run any questions on that um, I just want to clarify that we did have three quotes initially when we first did this the standard right we did yeah, yeah. and one of them was way higher and so right so we're we just focusing on the that. two when because uh, we went back and we said you know it's been two years now do you want to update your quotes um, so this is where we're at yeah so the um, the higher quote uh, uh, the folks that want to remove the existing insulation and make sure everything, there's no gaps, there's no holes, we're not sifting down. <laughs> uh, well, they would both be air sealing. 
Yes. Yep. But one would remove all the old insulation and then air seal. Hmm. Um, and there is, you know, from what I understand, my limited knowledge, there is a detriment to having the old insulation in there. It's got some moisture in it, hmm. as we know from various things like roof leaks, roof leaks, and ceiling dropping. Um, so that's a concern. Amy, do you know how old is old? I mean, it's like. Well, let's see, it was built in this century. Five. <laughs> I would guess it was in this century. Right. It's not like corn cobs and okay. you know newspapers, <laughs> rock but wall. there is some old. Yeah, it's probably old Rockwell. Um, there is some old. You know, you go through there and you find like programs from the high school, like you know, veterans something or other from the First World War. Wow. Oh. There's a lot of good stuff in there. I'm sure there's also skeletal remains and things of that nature in there I mean, you know mice and whatever there is there is a dead bird that's still there that was there two years ago when I was like that. so yeah. I don't think there's a lot of it I don't know just, exhuming uh, things to think about um, also a question that I have is um, uh, and this is for you um, Julie mm -hmm. the um, uh, the DPW the DPW or the facilities wants to put this attic insulation or something into their budget for 2022 uh, yes, the uh, DPW wants to put it in their uh, list of projects. We we um, usually just give the uh, maintenance uh, $100,000 to do whatever's their priority list. We don't vote on each individual one. So this would fall into that category. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, be, uh, because they're talking about HVAC and weatherization, um, it's going to be a further conversation about just how it goes, but they've they've um, set aside twenty five thousand for that. Great, yeah. The the two things definitely do tie in. You know, you insulate and you put in your updated um, air filtration systems, kind of in a in a scheduled manner. Right. Yeah. But is it in this year's budget? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because well, I know there are not passed yet, but yeah. there already are a bunch of other twenty five thousand dollar projects. Correct. Oh, uh, does this have they're, to? They're relatively smaller I believe okay yeah okay that's that's good I was wondering about that how, how sure are we that that roof is really weather sealed before we go about putting more insulation in and 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 uh, you know revamping the the uh, HVA system and so forth that I'm just hearing Bob saying that there's still some problems right well, although we don't right we don't know where that moisture is coming right. from we don't know if it's from those air ducts or the roof yeah. it be the fire suppression system maybe yeah, yeah I mean, you know the the handful of times i've been up there i haven't seen any moisture coming in from mm. above i haven't seen any evidence of it there's like plastic sheathing over a lot of that and and, that, and, and that's still dry, that plastic sheet. Right, I mean, I've been there. up there on rainy yeah. days and yeah, yeah. Okay. haven't noticed it, but it's worth looking at. Yeah. You certainly want to make sure that if we invest this much, that it stays dry. Okay, so can we have uh, a month to think about it or whatever and then take a vote as to whether we'll recommend one or the other by next month so we can answer some of these questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, but let me just address this, though. So Unitil has come up with a figure based on the improvements that this will make, and that figure is $8,203. Um, and Joe Van Gumbos has said that would be applicable to either job. Um, that both jobs meet the same criteria of um, ACH, which is stands for air something. I can't remember. I'm sorry. Um, so that takes both jobs down. You know, eighty-two hundred dollars, just nice. There may be a time limit to that. Mm -hmm. um, as we know, there's a lot going on with the PUC right now, uh, and their funding sources <laughs> and their leadership. So this may be something we <coughs> want to try to act on sooner, oh. yeah. sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. Yeah. All right. Good to know. So that's the uh, NH saves money. There would mm -hmm. be eight thousand dollars in New Hampshire saves savings for us. Yep. Um, if we act in the right timing. Okay. So I guess um, do you have anything else? Or Julie? No, I was just thinking that in the budget cycle, um, by our next meeting, the budget recommendation committee will be done and we'll have a feeling for 
well, they don't actually vote on on the uh, maintenance list, so but we'll have a feeling for um, anything else that we're hearing about mm. suddenly. <laughs> so. Well, I'm happy to talk to Corey about it. Sure. All right. But, so ongoing. We'll f do our last minute details here, and then we'll we'll finalize it next month. Everybody good with that? Any other questions? Yeah, I should make some space for you for us on the a select board meeting. Sure. We'll talk about it. Yeah. On the which one? The next one? No, not the next one. Oh. Uh, probably in December. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, Amy. Good work on that one. Okay, so moving on, now we're going to come to our, our presentation on community power. So both Cliff and Lou are on this committee, the new committee, the uh, Community Power Aggregation Committee. And, um, you know, the, the Energy Committee has been working on this project for, I don't know, maybe two years. We've been investigating it. And actually, that's why I invited Cliff to come aboard the Energy Committee, because I knew we would have this project upcoming. And he agreed that uh, he would he would work on this project for us. So thank you very much for your leadership. Uh, as many of you may know, he was former director of Rockingham Planning Commission. So he's kind of uniquely qualified to look at this from a regional planning perspective. Okay. You want me to start? First? Okay. okay. Um, well, I think, I think Cliff and I are, are here to present the ideas of community power, uh, particularly for people who are viewing and are unfamiliar with community power. So I thought I would uh, start with a quick introduction to what community power is and then turn it over to Cliff, um, who will talk a little bit more about the uh, Exeter Community Power Aggregation Committee and some of our plans for how we're moving forward and how we're trying to uh, inform and uh, educate the public about community power. But let me uh, start with, um, as I said, kind of a brief introduction to community power. And to explain how community power programs work, it's probably best to describe our current electric uh, supply situation. Uh, Unitil is the utility that provides electric service to Exeter, and it performs two important functions. First, it buys electricity from suppliers to meet Exeter's needs, and second, it distributes that electricity to its customers. The distribution function involves maintaining poles and wires, handling uh, customer relations, billing, and various other uh, aspects of the distribution. Uh, the, bill, the bills customer received from uh, uh, Unitil reflects, how, reflects these two separate functions. The top portion of the bill indicates the amount the customer is charged for the delivery services, and the bottom portion of the bill indicates the actual cost of the electrical energy supply to the customer. The electric supply provided by Unitil, called the default supply, contains about 20% of electricity from renewable sources, that amount is fixed by state regulation, and that default supply is the only supply choice available from Unitil. Community power agreements allow towns to buy electricity directly from suppliers. So for Exeter, Unitil would no longer carry out that purchasing function, but would continue to provide all of the delivery services it currently provides. This change has some advantages for the consumer. First, it's likely that a community power program will be able to provide an energy supply similar to Unitil's default mix at a slightly lower cost to the consumer. But more important is the fact that community power programs can offer supply options with greater amounts of electricity generated from renewable sources. Several New Hampshire communities have developed community power plans that offer three supply choices a choice similar to the utility's default supply, a choice containing 50% renewables, and a choice with 100% renewables. Ex Exeter could do something similar. In addition, some of the cost savings incurred by Exeter's direct purchase of electricity could be used to supply a reserve fund. That fund could be for, for used for projects to benefit Exeter, such as providing electricity storage facilities, more municipal uh, solar arrays, uh, modernizing me, uh, the metering that uh, occurs at every home. Um, the point is that the town would determine how those funds could be used. 
Finally, it needs to be said that if Exeter adopts a community power program, individual customers may opt out at any time to return to Unitil's default supply service. In addition, the program would impose no additional costs to Exeter taxpayers. So having said that, I'll turn it over to Cliff, who can explain a little bit more about uh, the Exeter Community Power Aggregation Committee and what we've been doing and uh, our plans. Thank you, Lou. Uh, Cliff sent it again. Mm. <clears throat> uh, the, mm. the uh, I'm gonna, as Lou said, talk a little bit about where we are on the, uh, the Exeter Aggregation Committee in developing a uh, community power plan for Exeter what our plans are for presenting it to the town. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to address a question that often comes up is, where did this come from and why all of a sudden is everybody talking about community power? It's an interesting question because community power as a concept, as something allowed under state law, has been around since 1993. That was when the uh, electric system in New Hampshire was deregulated, which essentially means that power production was separated from power distribution. As Lou is explaining, Unitil is responsible for distribution. Their no, utilities are no longer allowed to own power uh, production facilities. <coughs> they purchase power on the market and then distribute it through their system. So that's been in place since 1993, and the enabling law that said communities could themselves go out and purchase power has also been allowed since, since that time. Uh, rarely if ever used in New Hampshire, used in many other states, but n rarely if ever used in New Hampshire until this point, because the law had several facets that made it um, sort of a chicken and egg problem for a community to start um, um, a community power offering because we couldn't guarantee we had enough customers to negotiate a decent price for community power. And that changed in 2019 when the law was rewritten. And since then, many communities have um, be become more aware of, of community power, what the potential benefits are. And in fact, a coalition of communities has formed in the state. Exeter is a, an early member of that coalition uh, to help facilitate bringing that about. So that's why we are talking about this now, and where, whereas it's really not come up uh, for the past, uh, what, 30 years or whatever has, <laughs> that it's been allowed. So what I wanted to do is cover what the, <clears throat> the process is according to the state law for launching a community power program. The first step is that the board of, the select board has to, um, establish what's called an energy aggregation committee, and that's what Lou and I are, are on and representing uh, on the energy committee. The energy aggregation committee is responsible in turn for developing a plan uh, for the town's uh, establishment of a community power program. The selectmen um, formed the aggregation committee back in May, members were appointed. Um, you can see there on that slide the, the, the members, uh, well, not on that slide, actually. The members of the committee yeah, are... Okay. Um, oh, yeah, they're there. They're there. In the middle. Uh, right. The oh, there we go. <laughs> um, myself, Lou, Nick Devonshire, and Stephanie Marshall are the members of the um, aggregation committee. Our task is to prepare a plan and uh, we're in the middle of doing that now. Uh, we have a working draft in place and we plan to present that to the selectmen, which is the next step, um, in this early December. And in the meantime, hold various kinds of public outreach efforts uh, to help the community at large begin to understand what community power is um, and have a chance to have their questions answered about it. So we're working on this draft now. We'll present it to the selectmen in December. If the selectmen decide that this is an opportune thing for the community to do, to go forward with it, uh, the next process will be, the next, next step will be to present it to town meeting in March uh, for a vote. 
and if the town at that point decides to go forward with it um, by majority vote at town meeting, um, at some point after that, we will launch it. One of the things that, um, uh, a couple of things have to go into place before we can do that. One is that the PUC will have to formally write rules for uh, the implementation of community power uh, in, uh, by municipalities. Uh, they had started that process after the law was changed in 2019. It got held up by sort of organizational changes that um, occurred at the PUC and the creation of the Department of Energy at the state, which happened during the last session. Um, and so w there are no rules yet to launch the program. So there would be a, a delay probably between when it gets approved and when it would actually start. Um, we see that as not an impediment to acting on it now because since we're a town and we have a town meeting cycle, we don't think it would be beneficial to have to wait an additional year before we could go ahead and get started. But uh, th that, that's a bit in the future. Be before um, n before that happens, um, after we were, as we are developing this plan, we do plan to conduct sort of three public sessions. Two are hearings, and one is a, a question and answer um, opportunity for for folks. The one, the first one, is a question and answer. Um, panel, which um, we've actually already recorded part of it, the question and answer part, and the, and the uh, uh, sort of a series of, of scripted questions and answers. And then the public's chance to ask questions and have us respond is coming up um, next week, November 17th. Um, it will be, a, you can attend by Zoom as the information um, hopefully that you're seeing there uh, describes. It's going to be um, at 7 o'clock. And the first part of it, we'll see um, a pre-recorded Q&A session so that some sort of critical information gets explained before we open it up to general questions. And then we'll do that and see what people, um, what questions people have to, to ask. After that, um, we're also, that's about the time that we expect a uh, draft of the plan to be um, available and we'll have it posted um, on our uh, webpage, at the, the, the aggregation committee's webpage, which is part of the town's website, uh, certainly at least by the, the end of the month. And then we will also be having two um, public hearings. Uh, one is on November 29th. Um, that's going to be uh, in, right here in the Novak room. I um, believe it will be 7 p.m. Seven, yeah. 7 p.m. And we'll have a second public hearing on uh, December 13th. So let me backtrack a little bit now and talk more about what uh, the program will be like and what our plan is addressing. The, the law is fairly specific about uh, what a community must address as it develops a, an aggregation plan, a community power aggregation plan. Um, sort of several key elements. One is what's the structure? What's the organizational structure? And what role would the selectmen play? What role would the energy aggregation committee play? What role would a third party um, play if we, which we certainly will, uh, contract with a third party to provide the, the, uh, the services that we would need to purchase power and uh, manage the program? We'd have to, we have to address operations and funding. We have to address how the costs are established and paid for, what, how the rates are established. How, how customers opt in or opt out of the program, how we would begin and end agreements, what the rights of customers and participants are under the program, how things like net metering would be handled, if different than it is handled now, and how, um, um, 
how customers that are currently interacting with the utility, how any, any of those interactions would change. Before the committee can recommend to the selectmen and the selectmen in turn to the town, we have to make a finding that the plan is in the best long-term interest of the, of the town and its uh, current rate payers. Um, as I mentioned, we have to have public hearings and that's, that's in the works as on the dates that I mentioned. The select board, when they receive the plan and hear from us about its contents, have a chance to review it and ask questions, they then make the decision whether or not to submit it um, at that point uh, for the subsequent town meeting. They could decide to go ahead, they could decide to delay, they could decide this is not in the best interest of the town. Um, so a couple of other specifics about how this plan will operate. I mentioned that there had been a, an important change in the state law that made community power more feasible. One of the key changes was that um, a community that's adopting community power can um, take the approach that all customers that are not already um, assigned to a third party power provider uh, by their own choice will automatically become part of the Exeter community power uh, program. And that's the way we will approach this. Um, at the same time, we will not proceed with uh, launching the program unless uh, the price that we are able to achieve for that default power rate is at or below the existing uh, default power rate that uh, is provided through Unitil. So there will be no additional cost for someone who wants to continue to use the default uh, power mix. But what the, really the whole reason we're doing this is to, <clears throat> to introduce a higher, the opportunity at least for customers to buy into a higher renewable energy mix in what, what they purchase. And it's our hope uh, that <clears throat> we can offer uh, a mix, as, as Lou was alluding to, of say 50% renewable energy uh, for about the same cost, or maybe slightly higher cost than the default utility rate right now. That's our that's our goal. But as I said, our intention is to would be to not launch the program unless we can at least, uh, for the default rate, be at or below the the current um, cost, or the then current cost. Energy pricing is is dicey, uh, as 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 you probably all know. Uh, so this is often a moving target and this is why we will be using the services of people who are sort of professional in the business of um, contracting for 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 power um, I think that's probably most of what I wanted to get across in this basic introduction Lou is there anything you'd want to add no I think that I think that pretty much sums up where we are. Amy. Is there a chance that we are going to go through all these steps to get there and then find out that we can't get a, a rate that's lower than the default rate or equal to and then scrap the whole thing? I don't think what it would mean we'd have to scrap the whole thing. What, what, I, what, what the plan says now is that we won't launch it. We still have the plan. We still have the approval of the town. We wouldn't launch it at that point until we get to the, until we can uh, find that we're able to get a um, contract price that's less. So is that approval infinite? I mean, can we? Does it expire? I don't think not according to the it's not, not in the law. We can we can continue to to evaluate and decide to launch it when we reach that threshold. Okay. I would say that over time. As more communities do this, especially if they're associated with that coalition I mentioned, they'll have a larger uh, pool of customers and therefore will be able to leverage better rates over time. So it may not happen immediately. It may be the second or third year where, where we reach that magic point. It is a chicken and egg thing in itself in that the more towns that decide to wait until they can get that rate, the longer it may take for that to happen. 
I also wanted to, there's some, one important thing I wanted to mention that didn't, uh, that I forgot to mention, which was, yeah, I said that we would automatically opt in, uh, people would be automatically opted in. They can also opt out at the same time, and it will be very simple process to do that. You'll be notified uh, that this is happening once the launch begins, and you'll have an ample opportunity to decide, to decide no, I don't want to do this. Also, after that point, as long as you're in the default rate, you'll ha it'll be easy to opt out beyond that initial point, probably within a 30-day billing cycle or something like that. That's not something that we're completely assured about right now. For those who have chosen the plans that are have sort of more renewable content, the 50% or 90% or whatever it ends up being, uh, it's possible that those would have a contract limit, for example, that you would sign on to be on one of those plans for 12 months or 24 months or something like that, kind of like your cell, cell phone plan um, that you, you can't willy-nilly just go in and out anytime you want because you've signed on to a commitment and that has in turn gotten you a lower rate through for renewables. So these are all things that we're working on now and trying to figure out. I have a question. Julie. <clears throat> so if, if this plan goes into effect and, and we adopt it, um, what, I hear you, what I hear you saying is that we may have an option of choosing like a 50% mix or 100% mix. Each customer will have that option? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So we would essentially be offering three different products, uh, energy products. One would be mimicking the default rate that we mm -hmm. have now, which is... I think, what, 21% renewable. 21, 22. <coughs> by, by, according to the, the renewable portfolio. portfolio standards. The second group would, the second product would be something like 50%. And then the third one may not be 100%, it might be 90%, something like that, because we, you have to have some room for hedging. Um, but in any event, something like that. And um, I've been asked, uh, would this, would this setup mean that um, the town now becomes the broker for the, the town administration would become the broker, energy broker for the residents? No, um, not, not practical, I think, for um, towns of Exeter's size to take that on. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a heavy lift. And that's why the coalition yeah. uh, is planning to offer all of those kind of technical services. For example, um, um, the the process of notifying people, the, the process of taking phone calls, the process of processing people who want to join or leave during you know the, the during the year, all of those things would be we would contract for those services, um, and the the cost for that contract would be paid for out of uh, the rates, not mm -hmm. out of general taxpayer revenues. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Cliff. That was Welcome. that was fabulous. Great, yeah. And I just can't stop smiling. <laughs> I am so happy about this. This is really big. If and I get to vote for it. I know. <laughs> I'm just so excited. Um, you know, we've been. This is probably one of the largest things that this committee would have done uh, in conjunction with the aggregation committee. Um, if if this does indeed get voted in by the people. And, and works out like it's supposed to, it, it really would be huge. So, And um, it's interesting that we're having this kickoff kind of of the public education on this project the same week that there's a big climate summit, the COP26 in Glasgow. So this is kind of like our own COP here. <laughs> we're just doing it here on the ground. <laughs> okay. All right, anybody else? Shall we move on? Okay, then uh, Camille, our high school liaison. Um, so I wasn't able to do an article for um, November because we are starting to publish the first of every month and I didn't have an idea yet um, and I just couldn't write that month. Um, but I would love ideas for my December article um, if anyone has any now or if you want to email me later. Um, and I co like I um, worked on the Belmont Climate Summit um, that went really well. Um, and they're going to post the videos on their website soon so we can 
try to send those out if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, that was pretty much all that I have. Okay. Thank you very much. You want to do something on community power? I was just uh, going to say. On, on your next. I did that one for my uh, first uh, article of the I year. I thought you did, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can send it to you. Put a little reminder at the bottom of whatever you write so, so the knowledge comes from below and mm -hmm. moves up because your generation is really going to be interested in this. Mm -hmm. Did nope. you get any feedback from that article, Camille? Um, I haven't yet, no. Well, one thing that um, the committee is rifled here, which has like a lot of the information that Cliff just shared, as well as the schedule and the website and everything like that, this is something that maybe you could um, put a few piles of in the high school for the teachers and the students and the science classes and whatever. That's yeah. forthcoming. It's not quite finalized. Um, also, um, I was recently appointed the secretary of the environmental club, so I can try to okay. get some interest there. You could also maybe get the trifold directly published in the paper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So the next thing on the agenda is the networking category. So this month I uh, was networking with the new and improved Al Y Festival, which will is an idea to be reconstituted by the um, town natural resources planner, Kristen Murphy. Uh, she and I went over to the public library and spoke with the officials over there. And um, we have set a date for May 14th with a rain date of the 21st. Or maybe well, you want to call it a run date because who knows when the fish are actually going to run. Mm -hmm. So we've got both. And, and so there'll be films upstairs. There'll be children's crafts in the bottom of the library and an environmental fair on the lawn, which is called Founders Park, and then viewing um, of the fish, because it's all about the fish, actually. So this, this committee here will just have a table in the environmental fair. We'll talk about electric cars and community power and things like that. So that's kind of an exciting and fun project that we'll be working on. Um, any, any questions on that? Anything? Okay. Um, then we'll finish off with this uh, electric vehicle charger update. So I've been contacted by ChargePoint and um, Revision and various people. So that project is really getting some interest again because the RFPs are going to be due finally. And this is after... I think this has been two years in the works as well. And this is the Volkswagen monies um, finally being spent in New Hampshire, I think, come this spring. So we are hopefully in the running for that. Um, in addition, um, when we were at the local Energy Solutions Conference, I s attended a presentation that um, the resilience coordinator of Dover had done, and he did a gap analysis of how many chargers are in Dover, how many electric vehicles are there currently, and then uh, how many are projected to be there in three, five, ten years, and the number of charges that will be needed at that time. So um, John Fluelling, who is an Exeter resident, and I are going to be working on this project to do a gap analysis, and then we will present our findings to the planning board and uh, whatever other committee is interested in. Uh, sustainability. Sustainability, yeah. So we'll, we'll present our findings. So that's probably a few months out, but um, that is what we're going to be doing there. And Renee, um, did that analysis include public charging stations, only public charging stations, or uh, proprietary ones like at a BMW dealer or something like that? I'm um, not clear. I think it had everything there. It just was a whole lot of pie, pie charts, graphs, things like that, and with a whole lot of headings. You know, I didn't study. I didn't study it, but it was just so much information. Great amount of information. But I do um, for ours. I do intend on um, including the ones that are at the dealerships, maybe workplace charging, mm -hmm. uh, just any any of the above, even if it. Uh, just to have it as a statistic, as a baseline to show where we are at now in 2022 with electric chargers in Exeter. Okay. Good. Anybody else? And, and a gap analysis, basically, you're, you're projecting what the needs would be in the future based on um, expansion of uh, electric cars, is that? Right, Cur currently 2% um, of all vehicles in the country are electric cars. The projected sales are exponentially, you know, there'll be four and then there'll be 10, so it just kind of ramp up very quickly. So we would like to be kind of um, in step with that and not 
behind, not lagging behind it so that, you know, um, the town is attractive to maybe some people that, electric drivers that want to live here. They know they can charge around town, although 80% of people do charge at home. The public chargers are intended more for tourism and for merchant type uh, applications. So currently we do have electric chargers at some public places or, or pu public private, like the Exeter Inn has one. But you know, I wouldn't just drive over there and plug into it unless I were going out to dinner at the Exeter Inn because this is a draw for the merchant. This is a draw for employers saying, well, you know, we, we have all these candidates. We or maybe we don't have all these candidates, but we have electric chargers, and maybe that turns a, turns a candidate into applying for their company. So these are things that um, I'll be looking at. You know, I'll be driving around to the hospital, see what they have over there, and all sorts of office parks around, and um, taking a full analysis. Uh, I've already met with Doug Eastman um, because I was hoping that he had a file drawer labeled EVC electrical permits, <laughs> but no, it's not that easy. Um, there is right there. <laughs> so yeah, I've spoken with him, and so he's on the watch out for uh, people who are applying. But oftentimes, they don't apply for the permit itself. If there's like a larger development project, it's kind of wrapped into all the other permits, so it's not just one singular thing. You have to kind of dig around for it. So um, we'll be digging. That might be something that we uh, suggest to the planning board to add to their application, whether or not this project involves electric vehicle a charging station. That would be a great Just idea. A little checkbox. Yeah, because I think that would make the hunting easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so I'm all excited about that project, too, and that's kind of the starting on another long-term project. But the town does have its first public charging station. We are on the map. We are on the app. If you open up where are the chargers in the entire country, for a long time we were not on there, and now we are. And that charger is a charge point paid station located at the Volvo station right next door to the McDonald's. So, <laughs> and, you know, um, when we have hosted the electric vehicle uh, charge, you know, the day, we, the annual day we have, and we have local owners come and they showcase their cars, Several have come up to me and said, you know, we live in Newburyport or Amesbury or, you know, further away, and we would like to come to Exeter and go out to eat, but we are not going to come here if there's no charger for us. Mm -hmm. So we just continue to go out to eat in Newburyport in Portsmouth. So they encourage me to encourage this town to get some charges so, so electric car people can mm -hmm. come into town to, to use our shops and restaurants. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're kind of winding down now. But this has been a great meeting. Anybody else have anything else? Yeah, I just said uh, I spoke with the sustainability coordinator at Exeter about trying to get Elizabeth Wilson oh, did you? here. Uh, oh. And he's trying to contact her. So Good. it's in the works, hopefully. Great. Okay, so Elizabeth Wilson was the keynote speaker at the Local Energy Solutions Conference. Um, she was a professor, a doctor, I believe, and uh, she's a great motivational person who spoke about all kinds of futuristic, what was it, the intersection of energy and sociology or... Yeah. It was very interesting anyway, so it would be yeah, great we'll if try we try to get her to be the main speaker for Climate Action Day. Great. In the spring, yeah. And then have her also speak to the, the townsfolk, you know, in the town hall or something like that. So kind of a public, a free public lecture mm -hmm. that we would host. be awesome. Okay. All right. Uh, motion to close. I move to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Exeter TV. Exeter TV is the town's public and government access channels, available on Comcast channels 98 and 22. Channel 98 is your channel. If you have an idea for a program, want to host your own talk show, or submit a film, we're here to get your content on television. On Channel 22, we bring you live and replay coverage of government meetings and other town updates. A third channel, Blue Hawk Media, is operated by SAU 16 and can be found on Channel 13 with all your school sports, events, and meetings. You can watch Exeter TV online at ExeterNH.TV, Apple TV, and on Roku. Find us on social media for extra content. 
subscribe to our YouTube channel, and hit the bell to get notified about live streams and new content. Tune in to our platforms every other Friday to watch the Exeter Bi-Weekly Report with recaps of recent events, updates from town departments, and messages from nonprofits in your area. If you head to our website, exeternh.tv, we invite you to sign up to our newsletter to receive monthly updates about new content, upcoming meetings, and more. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch Exeter TV and hope that you tune in to our other content as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's new. Items such as diapers and baby wipes, hygiene products, cigarette butts, and cat litter belong in the trash, not your toilet. They do not decompose in your septic tank and can shorten the life of your system. Harsh chemicals from drain cleaners and some cleaning products can also harm your septic system and should be used sparingly. 